Merci, Shkran, Todaraba. Months ago, when I was asked to come to speak at Kuchiching, I felt honored. I felt very honored. Days ago, when I start following, started following the Kuchiching conference online, I became scared. <laughs> really scared. I said, Wallahi, everyone there knows more about the Arab Spring than I do. And then last night, when I came to Kuchiching, what did I feel? I felt touched, really touched, by how kind everyone is here, including kindnesses to me as a small town girl from New Brunswick. <laughs> Even people from the big cities, Toronto and Montreal, said nice things to me. <laughs> and in the short time that I've been here at Kuchiching, I've met people whose ancestry comes from corners near and far. From under Amman to Amman, from the Shuf Mountains to Tulkarum, from Lithuania, from Brussels even. All of these people, Canadians, hyphenated Canadians. When I grew up in northern New Brunswick, <coughs> It was only years after I'd gone away to university that I realized that the Jaboras and the Asifs who ran the little corner shop where I bought my very first school books and pencils were actually Lebanese. And that when nobody was looking, they did things like eat exotic foods like hummus and tabbouleh. <laughs> nobody had talked about it then. And we talk about it now. And not only that, we celebrate it. Because this is Canada. And what about the Middle East? And the so-called Arab Spring? The session that I'm now taking part in was given the title, The Evolving Story. And the story is evolving in unpredictable, unprecedented, and at times, in very painful ways. So much so, that so many people now say, we don't use the expression, Arab Spring. It just doesn't speak to the realities of the ground. What a great phrase it is, Arab Spring. So politically delicious, it's irresistible. We as Canadians know the delight of when the spring arrives after a long, cold winter. And Arabs know the pain of living through a long, unending winter of political repression. But the person who coined that phrase must have come up with it in January and February of last year. In those heady months, heady, historic, and exhilarating. For years to come, historians and political scientists will ask, how was it, how did it come to be that a young fruit and vegetable vendor from Tunisia set himself alight and set an entire region on fire? I went to his town, his hard scrabble town in rural Tunisia, to meet his family. And I met his mother, Manubia, consumed by grief and clad in black. And she said, as any mother would say, he was a good boy. He just wanted a job to support his family. Well, 29 days was all it took to overthrow 23 years of authoritarian rule of Ben Ali. And the Egyptians watched this and said, Mabruk Tunis, Ishta. Because they were Egyptians, they said, the Tunisians can do that. Marbaros, Great Egypt. Egyptians took 
18 days that mesmerized the world. In the political Olympics, Egypt got the gold. And it looked so easy. Every time I went to Cairo, I thought, how did they do that? How did they get rid of robotic after 30 years? The first expression I learned when I moved to the Middle East in 1994 was this one. Mishmalum. What does it mean? Impossible. Unbelievable. It wasn't. But then the hard part started. The counterattack began in violence. As we've been hearing this morning, General Boucher charged months of brutal civil war in Libya. Brutal repression in the Bahrain. Violence and chaos in Yemen. And Syria. A slow burning protest that has now evolved into what can only be described as a war. Or wars. A civil war, a sectarian war, a proxy war, a new cold war. And now that Kofi Annan, the joint UN and Arab League envoy, has stepped down, admitting to all the world that his difficult assignment became mission impossible, violence is the only game in town. And what about the regions of the great powerhouse, Egypt? Well, many in Egypt are now asking, was there a revolution? And one despondent revolutionary said to me in Cairo, and there are many despondent revolutionaries in Cairo these days, did our revolution turn into a coup d'etat? Or was it a coup d'etat before it became a revolution? All that we know is that the military not only did not lose power, it took even more powers for itself. And Egyptians are exhausted by a chaotic and confusing choreography of extended elections and constitution writing that people in the Middle East say is the model how not to move in a transition to civilian rule. But Egypt is a changed and a changing country. A Muslim Brotherhood official who spent time in jail, is now sitting in the very seat that was once used by the president who put him in jail and is in jail himself. Mishma. And just a short time ago, I found out on my Blackberry that Mohammed Mursi, the man they called a spare tire because no one expected very much of him and he just was the alternative candidate, he's now sacked. Tantawi, the defense minister, and he's canceled the constitutional amendment, giving the military more powers. <laughs> the battle is not over. Expect the unexpected. In fact, many are now saying it's no longer an Arab Spring, it's an Islamist summit. Because in all the elections that swept across the region last year, Islamic movements swept to power. But perhaps that's not surprising. In years where political space was so restricted, it was the Islamic movements that were able to organize and mobilize underground and sometimes openly. So they were poised to take advantage of these new opportunities. But there's new challenges too. I was astonished to see in Egypt how much support the Muslim Brotherhood lost between the parliamentary elections and the presidential elections just a few months later. That is democracy. And the beauty and the power of democracy, of elections, is that you discover what kind of country you have. You discover who your neighbors are. And Yusri Fouda, who's an old colleague of mine, who's now one of Egypt's top two television anchors, puts it this way. It's like living in a house. And everyone in the house just lived inside their room. 
and they never went out. And then suddenly, everyone leaves their room and goes into the living room. And suddenly, you have to get to know who else is in the house, and in this case, it's the house of Egypt, and you have to find ways of getting along with each other. And it's not going to be easy, because everyone who lives in the house is Egyptian, but very different. But people like Yusri Fuda, and many people in Egypt, are optimistic in the long run. Because this, in a sense, is what this conference is all about. Unprecedented realities demand new ways of thinking, new ways of seeing. It's not just about leaving the rooms, it's also about leaving the boxes, the ways we look at politics and society. What about the phrases that we use so often? We talked about some of them this morning. The Islamists, the liberals, the seculars. What do those titles mean? What we do know is, if we look closely enough, is that the Islamic parties who are now fighting for votes in the ballot boxes are not the Al-Qaeda jihadi-linked parties that dominated Islamic movements a decade ago. And look at Tunisia. Rashid Gunushi, who was convicted in exile for being an Islamist, came back home to Tunisia with his views on Islam and democracy shaped by the 20 years he had spent in London. Now, his views may not be shared by all Arabs. They may not be shared by everyone in this room. But a majority of Tunisians seem to believe in them, seem to believe in what we have seen so far to be a pragmatic kind of politics, which talks about an inclusive and accountable process of democracy and decision making. It's not going to be easy. Libya has just voted for a broad coalition of forces dominated by people who are called liberals, but they don't call themselves secular, and in fact they have a lot of Islamic ideas. So how do you describe them? What we do know is that Libyans didn't vote for the Islamists, who were so openly and generously backed by Qatar, the region's new financial and political powerhouse. The vote in Libya was a vote for Libya. We are where we are, the expression that leaders like to use. And where are we? Well, there's pessimism in some corners, in some places. There's frustration in others. And there's fear. Fear among some minorities, including Christians, but many others. Fear, too, among the women about where this is all heading. And there is a worry. There are too many guns in too many places in too many of the wrong hands. But something else has happened, and it's deeply profound. A deeply profound way of thinking across that region, which means the region will never be the same. And for that reason, some people say, not Arab Spring, not Islamic Summer, Arab Awakening. What was different about 2011? A young, political savvy generation had come of age, and they had new political tools and weapons, and a creaky, corrupt political system in so many countries across the region simply couldn't continue in that way. And there were new rallying cries. Karama, dignity, huria, freedom. And perhaps the most powerful of all, we have lost our fear. And we saw it. We saw it in the Tunisians who took to the streets and had been so long devoid of any politics. We saw it when Egyptians ran into the rows of riot police and into the clouds of tear gas. There was never going to be a smooth, multi-lane, Gardner Expressway from repression to reform, from dictatorship to democracy. Some places, you would say, have veered so far off that highway, you wonder, are they ever going to get to their destination at all? 
When I went to Tahir Square in June, I kind of looked at it in the way you sometimes look at an old boyfriend or girlfriend. You take a look and you think, what did I ever think was attractive about them? <laughs> <laughs> there it was, the iconic square that made history. Suddenly, this well, it's just a rocky piece of ground surrounded by traffic. It was just full of a few tattered tents. And I mentioned this to a friend of mine, the Egyptian-American Mona al Tahawi, who was at Kujijin last year, and she said, well, you know, you're right. But Tahrir Square is not a physical square now. Tahrir is a state of mind. And we all have some Tahrir inside of us now. This extraordinary sense that change is possible and that there is hope. There is hope. But there is also deep anxiety. And in the region, right now, much of that anxiety is focused on Syria. And let me speak for a moment about a country that is in the headlines now and will be in the headlines for some time to come. It could have been different. In March, when the first peaceful protest began last year in Syria, Syrians said Bashar al-Assad is not a Mubarak. He's not a Gaddafi. But for reasons that everyone is still trying to fathom, he approached the peaceful protesters from the very start as they were armed gangs long before they were armed, and long before they were gangs. He did, like his father Hafez did decades earlier when he was faced with political opposition, he struck back the violence, <laughs> such that now there are a lot of arms, and there are a lot of gangs, including Al-Qaeda. And when I think about today's topic, an evolving story, when I think of Syria, I think of one neighborhood in Damascus. I was fortunate to visit more than once. Last September, when I got what was the first official BBC visa to visit Syria, I went to Barze in the northern suburbs of Damascus to talk to Syrians as they left Friday prayers, as they left the mosque. And at a time when the region was shouting, we have lost our fear, we found a place where people were too afraid even to say they were afraid. And one man summoned up great courage, and he wrote on a piece of paper and he shoved it into my colleague's hand. And what did he scribble in haste and in fear? Thank you. But we cannot meet you. The army is in the streets and the people are afraid. Other people, other Syrians, indicated with their eyes. The troops were at the end of the street. The intelligence agents were all around us. Six months later, we went back to Babasse. We went back to the mosque and went back to that street. And we met an old man coming out of the mosque, and he pointed to the street, and he says, don't talk to me, go talk to the young people. And we went down the street, and what did we find? Streets full of people, young and old, men and women, holding banners, <laughs> shouting loudly slogans against President Assad. And they took us inside that warrant of streets, into a house that was riddled with shrapnel and gutted by explosions. A house, they had said, was used by the Free Syrian Army until it was attacked by the government. Last month, Barse, the neighborhood which had now lost its fear, was attacked by helicopter gunships. And with every month that passes, more neighborhoods start protesting, more neighborhoods, more cities are engulfed by war. President Assad still has support. He still has one of the most powerful armies in the Middle East. But he's losing support, and his military is under strain. 
the opposition outgunned and outnumbered, the momentum is now with them. But for how long? How long and at what cost? Let me end today by telling you about two people I recently, recently met in Lebanon. Because they tell me a story of a country where two sides are now armed, backed by different external actors, believing they are on the right side, believing they are the winning side, and believing they will fight for a better Syria. The first person I met, I met in his office in Beirut. And it's an office like I imagine many of you sitting here today have, an office full of books. Books on the chairs, books on the floor, books on the walls. A man who knows his politics and his history. And he told me in no uncertain terms that this was not a war about reform or democracy. This was a war where Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Turkey, widely believed to be arming the opposition, were fighting a war for power. And President Assad, he said, would win. He would win, he said, against a quarreling and divided opposition. And the holes, as he called them, had been closed. The security gaps which led to this stunning explosion in the heart of President Assad's inner circle that killed four of his top security advisors. And the fighting, which had right in the heart of Damascus, which had caused so many of us to go to the region thinking the end was near, has now been quashed. It will take time, he said. Look at Lebanon. It took 15 years. 15 years in Lebanon's civil war. Will it last that long in Syria? Probably not. And there are many reasons for that. But let me tell you just one of them. The other person I met, I met in northern Lebanon at a children's playground, which is like a playground you'd see anywhere in Canada. But behind the clapping and the coloring were stories that no child should have to live. Of the tens of thousands of Syrians who flee their country every day, more than 50% are children. Children not just fleeing the violence, but children who have themselves been tortured, shot at, and watch people die in front of them. I met a girl of 12 years old with a long braid down her back to protect her identity we called her Reem. And Reem told me, my best friend Hulud, she died in front of my eyes. And Hulud, as some of you will know, in Arabic it means immortality. But Hulud died at the age of 12. And Reem, with all of that precise detail that children like to use, told me, she said the bullet went into her cheek and it came out her neck and then she was on the ground in a pool of blood. Not long before, Reem's own house was also attacked. And a wall fell on her mother, her father, and her little brother. Alhamdulillah, thank God, they all survived. But when Halud died, the family said, we must go now. We must flee to Lebanon to safety. We must flee our neighborhood in Homs, a central city that has borne the brunt of most of the violence. I went to homes in May and saw these neighborhoods. Neighborhoods which go on for miles and miles where not a single house has been left standing. These are the war crimes in our time. I said to Reem, you're a brave little girl. What do you want to be when you grow up? And without a moment's hesitation, she said, I want to be a lawyer. I want to help people get out of prison. And then I moved on to what was going to be the last question. And suddenly, what she said caught up with me. Why would a 12-year-old girl ask her, talk about a prison? 
I said, Ron, why do you say that? And with a child, the voice of a child that has seen the worst of an adult's war, she said, my two brothers went to prison. And when they came out, they put in a walk. One story, one young Syrian. It's a prison run by President Assad's forces. But this is a war where abuses and violence are being perpetrated by both sides. And both sides are being armed by outside actors. And the longer this goes on, the more difficult it will be in a post-Assad Syria, in a Syria of transition. And the longer it goes on, the more the neighbors will be absorbing a growing number of refugees, and the more the neighbors will also absorb the threats which pose challenges to their own fragile political systems. And that's why the neighbors are worried. The stories of the Syrian backer that I met and a child stayed with me for another reason. There were two very different conversations, but they had one thing in common. They both involved Canadians. The Syrian supporter is actually a Lebanese man who, when he was a young boy, fled like so many Lebanese to Canada for refuge. And the woman who translated Reem and gave her voice was also Lebanese Canadian. And both of them said to me, your country represents the best in values. In the last 17 months, as I've traveled across the Middle East and North Africa, I've met so many Canadians. Canadians like the Lydian Canadian inspiring young woman who's fighting for women's rights in Libya, who speaks with an accent from Saskatchewan, but works with a passion and an understanding of democracy that comes from a love for her ancestral land in Libya and the land of her upbringing which is Canada. I've met Jordanian Canadians, Moroccan Canadians, Egyptian Canadians, Scottish Canadians, French Canadians, all kinds of Canadians. And so at a conference, when we're asked to consider the Arab, the Arab Spring implications and opportunities for Canada, what do we say? We say that the events are not taking place in lands so far from us, in cultures which are so radically different from us, not in the world in which we live, not in the kind of Canada that we are today, the kind of time where not a single one amongst us and beyond this room can say, I didn't know what was happening. And there are others far more qualified than I am in this room who can talk about what Canada can do. But all I will say is that I think what people want is they don't want us to do it for them. In Libya, after Tripoli fell, so many Libyans said to me, we don't want to be Afghanistan or Iraq. We don't want armies of advisors. We don't need them. We need some, and we'll tell you which ones. And in the case of Libya, we can pay for them. On the security side, there are hard choices for Canada and other countries of whether to arm or not to arm the rebels. On the humanitarian side, it was interesting to see that our foreign minister, John Baird, rushed to the region this weekend to show his support to offer money for the refugees of Syria in Lebanon and in Jordan. And everyone in this room knows, and it was mentioned last night, about how Canada for decades has played the leading role when it comes to Palestinian refugees, and it's appreciated to this day. But the Palestinian refugees haven't gone home yet. The Iraqi refugees haven't gone home either, which is what makes all of the neighbors nervous about the Syrian exodus. This is not about a season, be it spring or something else. 
This is about a generational change, deep-rooted structural change that will change not just a region, but many countries across the world. And I would only hope, and I think everyone here would hope, that Canada would be a part of that world. A partner for the region, for the peoples of mid the Middle East and North Africa, who only want what all of us want. Democratic, accountable, inclusive government. Freedom to hold the kind of conversation, a kuchiching kind of conversation. And this, this simple, spectacular, splendid,